computer. And it looks like it is. So we want to welcome everybody back who's decided to come back for a little more punishment or maybe some education, however you look at it, uh, maybe for some friendship among uh, the group. Um, and we're happy whoever made it here and like we usually start out the sessions um, with. Are there anybody you want to speak up? First time you've come to the class, if it is, you might let us know how you found out about it. Or if, you know, you're old to the class and you've got a question like answered or you want to have a little input, we're all here. I, I just want to say congratulations, Charlie, on getting your curriculum at school. They need it. They've needed it forever. Yeah, I'm Ray. So thank you. you. We're... Um, we're feeling pretty good about it. It's not done yet. They're looking into it, but they, I, I cannot see them um, begging out at this point in time, doing anything different. I'm optimistic. Well, it's way farther than you've ever been before, so. Yes, sir. Good to see you. Glad you could make it, Ray. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody else? I guess I need to look around the room unless Scott, do you see somebody who is kind of? Uh, I think I recognize most of the names. Uh, one that jumps out. I just wanted to say Zoom user, so who knows? <laughs> I don't know who okay. that is. <laughs> I think that's uh, Karen. She was on earlier this afternoon. Okay. So, um, so there will probably be a few more people who uh, jump on over time, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. We're on our 36 questions that everyone, uh, if they knew the answer to this, would be pretty comfortable in telling their friends and family about why they're choosing to do whole food plant-based. Uh, we're going to kind of interrupt that in about a half hour. Uh, we're going to be listening to a session uh, which may be important to some of you. Um, some of the older people in the group, it's important for your grandchildren. And some of the younger people in the group, it's important for your children, this session. The session is gonna be on um, gaming and um, the effect that it has on our youth, our children, on our adolescents, and some of the uh, problems associated with that, some of the benefits associated with it. So um for those of you who are not there in the afternoon session uh you probably want to stick around and listen to his session uh, it's a third year medical student who asked me if he could talk on the subject i really enjoyed it this afternoon it was worthwhile to listen to again in my opinion okay so i'm going to go ahead and share my screen now and then we're going to get on to a few more questions because we're up to a quorum of 27 people. And I'm gonna go over here to the questions themselves. I think it's right here. And Scott, I think we ended at 12 and we're on 13. Correct. That's correct. So, so 13, the question goes something like this. Um, how is our planet affected by what we eat? And for those of you who attended that session, uh, we're gonna scan down here to number 13. And I encourage you all to follow these videos. Uh, Scott showed us last week where you could find these questions and answers on the website. And he might go through that again if you forgot, just ask us. Um, but you might check out these videos on diet and climate change, cooking up a storm, uh, how much water goes into an eight ounce steak. You can't be a non-vegan environmentalist, 101 reasons to go vegan. These are all really good vid videos to show you that the one thing that we could do uh, to uh, have less of an impact on global warming and effects on our land usage and water usage and polluting of our uh, oceans, creating dead zones is to stop um, having 
animals as our main food source, as we currently do in the standard American diet, and becoming more the world diet. So I know this is a huge ask to have people use food that's grown that we're feeding to those animals, uh, which are now middlemen. It's a big ask to say, well, let's just us start eating them and, and leave the animals alone. <laughs> Uh, we'll save on land and water, we'll be healthier, we'll have less disease, and the impact is huge, uh, greater than all the transportation that we use, and a lot of people are not aware of that. So just another factor for especially the younger generation who doesn't have much chronic disease, they don't have much diabetes or heart trouble or um, high blood pressure in the younger age group. So they're not as much interested by listening to the events of, or the advantage of changing what we eat to more whole food plant-based, but they are concerned about the environment for sure. And some of them are concerned about the animals themselves, how they're treated in concentration camps and those issues. All right, let's go on back. After I do a couple questions, we'll stop and see if you have any uh, more questions on your own. Soy. Uh, what about soy? You know, for years, a number of you have learned that if you've had breast cancer, you may go to a doctor who tells you don't eat soy because it has estrogen effects. And, you know, if you listen to a couple uh, videos by Gregor and look at the actual science, you will find that uh, for those people eating more soy, if they have developed a breast cancer, they have a longer life expectancy, less recurrence rate of breast cancer in their life. And so where do you find that? You go down to the answer at number 14. You see a couple videos here, uh, one by at nutritionfacts.org. And uh, actually there's a companion video to that, I believe. And uh, you can find out that uh, eating soy, uh, there are different receptor sites, alpha and beta, and you'll find out the effects of, of soy. Uh, the alpha effects tend to uh, promote more breast cancer, which is the estrogen that humans produce. And the soy has a greater effect in humans on the beta receptors, which tends to promote bone strength and uh, doesn't have the effects of producing the breast cancer on the and, uh, yeah. alpha. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, it, what was exciting was when I went to the uh, International the Nutrition and Medicine Conference in Washington, DC in August of last year, I actually got to see a presentation by the original uh, researchers that, that discovered the, the different receptors and the different effects of the phytoestrogen. So it was really inter interesting. So I got to see the original research and he's the world the world's expert on phytoestrogens and and the effects it has on the body and it was really really cool to see that because that stu those studies were pu first published in 2012 so you know any any providers that are still saying that you shouldn't eat soy because of you had breast cancer they're they're about 11 years behind on the science now <laughs> so that's kind of embarrassing but uh so we try to dispel that myth here and actually they also talked you know, the American Cancer Society even put out a statement saying, you know, to promote the use of soy in breast cancer. So, uh, yeah, so pretty, it's tight, the tide's changing, but uh, as you, as those of us in the room that are in medicine know that sometimes the, the change in clinical practice can take, can be lagged behind the science a ways. And so we need to work on that. I'm kind of curious, is there anybody who is told uh, or who believes that soy they shouldn't be eating soy because it increases their risk of breast cancer. Just kind of curious if there's anyone in the room who's, I, most of you have your cameras off, so it's hard to tell, but for those who have them on, I don't see. There is one hand raised. And so I, I guess that's an a, either a yes, or it's uh, you can unmute and talk if you'd like, Tona. I'm sorry, I'm not Tona, I'm Johanna again here with uh, Tona uh, tuning in. 
but uh, I had breast cancer less than 11 years ago. And yeah, that was one of the things because it was estrogen, you know, um, positive or estrogen. I don't know the terminology that they use, but they told me not to do the soy thing. Yeah. So yeah. we would encourage you to go to uh, nutritionfacts.org, listen to the latest science about it, uh, just do a search on soy and breast cancer. And um, uh, you may show it to your uh, current physician and you may find that soy is really a healthier choice. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that with us. It's one of the reasons we teach the classes is because we wanna share the information. We also wanna be challenged. Like uh, if for some reason you don't believe it, um, ask your doctor, let them look at the the evidence that you present in the form of uh, articles or videos. And uh, let's see what their take is. Maybe they'll change their mind also. Okay, anything else? Then I'm gonna share the screen again. It's kind of fun to do. And we're going back to the next number. And the next number was somewhere in 15. 15, next. processed meats. Processed meats are considered what? Class one carcinogen by the World Health Organization. And what are processed meats? So first of all, what is a class one carcinogen? Um, some of you, uh, most of you have heard of asbestos. You probably wouldn't want to be exposed to it uh, because of the lung cancer issues. Um, and so that's a class one. Uh, it's a one that has been demonstrated to um, either initiate cancer or promote the growth. There are other, there are many others but plutonium is another one. <laughs> yeah, very good. So uh, the question is, would you want to keep exposing yourself to something that's a class one carcinogen? And if you wouldn't, then you want, may want to see what processed meat may be troublesome for you. Um, I just went to a birthday party for a five-year-old. And at that, what do you think was served? It was pizza. What do you think was on the pizza? Let's see if there are any of these processed meats on the pizza for the kids who are attending this birthday party. Processed meat is meat that has been preserved by curing, salting, smoking, drying, or canning. Some processed meats, that's most all meats actually, <laughs> uh, unless you're eating raw meat. I don't know how many of you are using your teeth and biting into an animal and just eating raw meat that is unprocessed, but most meats are processed. But they also include sausages, hot dogs, salami, bacon, ham, salted and cured meat, corned beef, smoked meat, dried meat, beef jerky, canned meat, and the heterocyclic amines that are produced when you cook the steak on the grill or the chicken on the grill. Is that news to anybody? Because if it is, then you may want to dive into this a little bit further by checking out this um, link and uh, give some serious consideration as to whether you want to continue uh, serving this to your children or your grandchildren. How important are those holidays to you that you have to keep eating like your parents and grandparents. Maybe it's time for us to have a little change. Just a thought. All right, before I get too controversial here, I don't know if that's possible to tone me down, but sort of like toning down John McDougall, although I'm no John McDougall, but I do have some kind of characteristics that he possesses. Um, <laughs> let's go on to 
Can you name the four root causes of disease? I know there are some of you in this room who can name the four root causes of disease. So let's talk about them one more time because there may, you might think there's actually six if you're studying for your lifestyle medicine certification, but you should at least be able to identify four of those six. Anybody want to share? What leads to disease or what can bring you health? Four things. Number one. The food you eat. Yeah, what you eat. Okay, what else? Sleep. Uh, <laughs> sleep, what's that? Sleep. Sleep. How, whether you're getting adequate sleep, which could go under, in my mind, stress-related problems. Okay. And it's also social connection is kind of related to stress in your life. So stress in my mind is one, what you eat, how you move throughout the day, whether you're a couch potato or whether you're getting up and moving about throughout the day, much healthier. And the last is the chemicals that you choose. We all know about smoking, not healthy for you, yes. Most of us know about alcohol and it's not particularly a health food. Um, many of us don't know the third or fourth leading cause of death is doctor prescriptions. So um, a number of us for a number of years have thought, we go to the doctor, we get a pill to cure us or help us with our disease. What we're getting a large amount of the time is a pill to treat our symptoms, but not necessarily what's causing the disease. Now, that may not be true of thyroid medication, but from high blood pressure medicines and diabetic medicines, cholesterol lowering medicines, treating a number or a symptom, not the root cause. The root cause of most of our chronic illnesses is the foods we eat, how we move, chemicals we choose, and how we deal with stress. So I hope that you get that by the time you get done with our classes that you are really feeling comfortable that you know what could bring you health. Doesn't mean you necessarily do everything like you would like to do it, but at least you have the knowledge and the seeds planted and you can choose what you choose to do. Um, our concern is that people don't even get that knowledge. They don't learn about how important those four things are in their life or six things if you're going to add the sleep and and social contact with them how important they are to our health and whether we develop disease any questions from anyone just punch a button or unmute yourself see if you have a question i know my voice tends to be kind of booming and may try to drown out people. I try not to do that, but it's beyond me how I can be different. Howdy, go for it. You're, there you go. You're muted still, oh, there you go. Um, I have a question. Next year in person classes at the YMCA, does it mean that the Zoom classes will be gone? No, no. We'll, still, we'll still do the Zoom classes. And thanks for bringing that up too, because we, uh, me and Charlie and Eric uh, Colgrove, we were at the at the YMCA grand opening on Saturday at the, for the ribbon cutting, and we uh, <laughs> we were set up there with the Peace Health at the Peace Health booth, and we were passing out class flyers and cards for these classes and Eugene plant based providers, and and so we'll uh, we're looking forward to the in person classes in February, and we'll uh, you can sign up for those on the website, and we also uh, yeah plan to keep the Tuesday night classes going. I have another question. Will the yeah. Zoom class be linked to uh, through the YMCA or is it separate? It's, it's separate. separate right now. And uh, I mean, you in, know, in, in, in the new, uh, in the next year. It's separate uh, right now. I don't know that we've really discussed doing Zoom. Uh, it's, you know, we have to bring the computer back and forth and it's, you know, 
there are some logistics involved in that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let us use the room uh, and see how it works out. We're not sure yet. Oh, OK. Thank you. You're welcome. That was it. Now, Lisa, Chick, uh, I know that we offered to have you talk for a little bit. And then this afternoon, mm -hmm. I had the student come and go over a topic, and I invited him to come at 730. So I want to give you some time to, it's not a lot of time, but some time to share what uh, you might like to share with us uh, on anything. I can't remember what we offered to have you do before, but um, is there anything that you have on your mind that, um, I'm not sure if you're even by, it. yeah, it looks like you are by it. So go for it, talk to us, I'll give you time and I'll give him a little less time if we need to, whatever works out. Oh, that's okay. I, I, to be honest, I actually forgot that I was supposed to do a little presentation tonight. Um, and I'm still packing for my Seattle trip tomorrow. Okay. So maybe when I get back, I can share some, uh, <laughs> share about Seattle and whatever else I want to talk about. Oh, okay. <laughs> that be okay. Yeah, that'll be perfect. It's a relief, actually, because I uh, promised uh, Bilal uh, a, um, you know, time in tonight's class starting about 7.30. Perfect. So, Let's so give that them works all the out time. great. And <laughs> you might enjoy listening to him while you're packing. I'm sure I will. Thank you. You're very welcome. It was fun tonight at Nutrition and Medicine, too. Yes, good turnout. Yeah, it was great. Okay, any other questions from anybody? I'm going to go ahead and share the screen and go back for just one or two more questions. Uh, so let's go on to nitric oxide, the benefits for high blood pressure. What are they? What is nitric oxide? Does anybody know? So we're going to go down to 17. And if you don't know, you can see oxygenating blood with nitrate-rich vegetables. Here is the video. Check it out. Nitric oxide is produced when you eat dark green leafy veggies and beets combined with, you don't have to eat the beets, but if you want to eat the beets or beet greens, they combine with your saliva. And in the stomach, nitric oxide is produced. This dilates the arteries. Mm -hmm. It keeps them running smooth. And uh, it uh, you know, allows them to heal themselves up. Uh, Dr. Esselstyn is so um, emphatic about how important this is, keeping your arteries clean, that he recommends you're eating green six times a day to uh, reverse heart disease. Now that seems pretty extreme, but boy, if I were having chest pain and I was ready to have my chest cracked open, it would seem <laughs> so extreme to me to eat greens six times a day since I'm eating them about two or three times a day, or I eat about the amount of six times a day worth of greens between my breakfast and dinner. So, I encourage you all, if you have high blood pressure, to consider increasing more of the dark green leafies in your life. Uh, this is a um, nitric oxide is a molecule that causes increased blood flow uh, to your organs. It actually, there is a pill uh, that has come out in the, in several forms. There's Viagra, Cialis, Levitra. They're kind of sexually enhancing medications used for erectile dysfunction, but they come with side effects. Whereas when you're eating dark green leafy vegetables, they don't come with uh, s significant side effects like the pills. So get your nitric oxide from the dark green leafies in your life. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I've had a lot of patients that uh, I never, I had forgotten to mention to some of my male patients that uh, 
hey, you're probably not going to need that Viagra anymore if you make these changes because we we're focused on, you know, their heart disease or their diabetes or their blood pressure or something like that. And I, I mean, I, I, I mention it more now, but uh, in the past I hadn't, you know, because it's a sensitive topic. And I've had some patients say, Scott, you should have told me that at the beginning. I would have changed my diet in a heartbeat if you if you'd admit if he'd led with, hey, you're not going to need your Viagra anymore. It's like eating a whole food plant based diet. It's like like having Viagra flowing through your your veins 24 <laughs> seven. That's a great point, and you know I use it now myself with uh, people who I see are having issues, and uh, I try to encourage them. I have a question. Yes, Trouty. How much of the greens do you have to eat? I mean, six times, but is a handful or is how much each time? I think about it as a handful. Uh, I, I, Scott, have you heard anything? Yeah, Dr. Essel, Esselson says a, a, fist, a fist size serving six times a day is what Esselson does for his heart disease patients. But what's, you know, Gregor, it's, you know, three to what, three? Three servings of leafy greens a day. That's a yeah, cup each, right? Yeah, and it could be a half to a cup, depending on where you're reading. Yeah. How so, much? Half a cup? Half to a full cup. If you go a half a cup six times a day, you're getting three cups. That's pretty good. Okay. <clears throat> if that doesn't work, then we'll encourage you to do a little more. Uh, Ken. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. Fire away, Ken. I see your hands up. Unmute. Okay, there it goes. Um, can you name off a whole bunch of things? Because um, I think there's a lot more green leafies than we think. So, like, does it include celery? Um, it doesn't include celery. It includes arugula. Uh, it includes chard, uh, collard greens, kale, um, Beet greens, mustard Beet greens. greens. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Esselson has a, he rambles off all the, the green leafies and there's probably 10 or 15 of them that he rambles off in his lectures. Do you have Doc, Dr. Gregor's Daily Dozen phone, the app on the phone? I have it everywhere. Okay, so look up under his uh, greens. Uh, it will list it there. Well, it sounds like it, it's only leaves. It's not stalks. It's not be, uh, green beans. Not green beans. No, okay. no, no. Just leaves. How about well, bok choy? Bok choy is one. I think yes. that's one. And, he, and even beets, be, even though we said beet greens, but beets themselves, the root beet, B-E-E-T, it also is pretty high in nitrate. So that's one of the exceptions is that's not a leafy green. Uh, beets themselves are really high in nitrates. So we could do a quick Google search, which I'm going to do right now. I and have a question. Go ahead, Trouty, with your question. Does it have to be cooked or do you have to eat it raw? Uh, it's better it if matter. you eat it raw. Raw? But me, me, doc, Dr. Esselson has his... Uh, patients do it lightly steamed just for just because it's more toler tolerated and they can eat a larger volume and just a drop of balsamic vinegar on it too because the balsamic vinegar actually helps with absorption and and in pro producing the nitric oxide also so yes yeah. but yeah here but on dr gregor's daily dozen he has arugula beet greens collard greens kale um uh, Assorted young salad greens, mustard greens, sorrel, spinach, Swiss chard, turnip greens. Those are the ones he has listed on the daily dozen. So what um, about iceberg lettuce? Every and you know, we 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 are raised everybody telling us there's no nutrition in iceberg lettuce. It's it's like mainly water. I don't think there's much nitric oxide in that. So for our salads, we should be using um Spinach. What else should we put in our salads for the leaves? Spinach, kale, arugula, collard greens. Raw radicchio. <laughs> yeah. never them. I, eat them. I eat them every day, but I cook them. So you think I should try 
eating some raw collard greens. Yeah, they're good. They actually taste good. And and if you get them out of the garden, the stems are like sweet. I like the stems. I eat them. I do too. Thanks. Don't give up on the stems. They're great fiber, good food for your microbiome. One thing I I had uh, beet I had beet greens this morning, and uh, probably have them once a week because or twice a week because I buy be beets. Um, what about the oxalates? Are they just yeah? Tell us about the oxalates. That there's a little concern in beet greens. Yeah, if you have a handful of oxalate kind of containing foods a day, you're probably going to be fine. If you're eating three or four handfuls uh, and you have a history of kidney stones, that's probably not a smart move. Uh, probably better to eat other uh, dark green leafies that don't uh, have so much oxalate in them. So I, if you have a history of uh, being a kidney stone former, uh, keep it to a handful of uh, oxalate, high oxalate containing foods. That's what I would and do. The, and, and the highest of the greens are beet greens, Swiss chard, and... Um, is the spinach? Spinach. Spinach, yeah, Maybe. sorry, spinach, yeah. That's the third one, yes. Yeah. Spinach is the highest, and then uh, beet greens and Swiss chard are the other two that are pretty high in oxalate. Thank you, guys. You're very welcome, Ken. Thanks for the questions. I'm sure others have similar issues. Okay, so I want to switch gears uh, momentarily or for now, not for just a moment, but um, I heard a talk this afternoon by one of the third year students from uh, Pomona um, and uh, I asked him to come back at 730 that I would give him time uh, to share his presentation with us again. Uh, I think you'll find it fascinating, interesting and important especially if you have uh, interaction with any kids, uh, any grandkids, any adolescents, and potentially with some adults. Um, so we've got kind of a mixed group. So I'm gonna welcome Bilal. Bilal, uh, I'm glad that you made it. And uh, we're looking forward. All you need to do is check out uh, again, you can kind of introduce yourself a little like you did this afternoon or less and carry on. Yeah, hello, hello. So thank, thank you again, uh, bigger audience this time. Some of you here are familiar faces, so you're going to hear this a second time. My apologies. But for those of you who are new, welcome. Uh, it should be fun. My name is Bilal. I'm a third year at Western University, but I go to the Pomona campus. I've been living in Southern California my whole life, and I've been part of the lifestyle medicine track ever since my first year. And I kind of explained this uh, in the afternoon, but uh, my motivation for lifestyle medicine started with my dad when he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes at the age of 40. Uh, other, Despite the fact that he lives an otherwise healthy lifestyle, and diabetes is something that does run in my family, so it did eventually catch up to him. Uh, but what he was able to do is through lifestyle modifications, diet, exercise, improved sleep, you name it, he was able to hold off the medications until the age of 50. So a whole 10 years without medications and their side effects, I'd consider that a win. Of course, it's not perfect, but we can't have everything. Um, so with that, especially uh, one of the things I talked about, too, was uh, the glucometer, how I'd see him you know, constantly checking his blood sugar at night. And I didn't like that, you know. And I could imagine a future where I'm 40, 45, and then I have to prick my finger every night, and it, it doesn't look fun. And being unhealthy, generally speaking, in, in any capacity is no fun. And we, we try in lifestyle medicine to address some of the chronic problems that we have before they become serious health complications. Nobody wants to live an unhealthy life, and lifestyle medicine is arguably one of the best ways to do so, um, to live a healthy life. And what I'm going to be talking about today is a topic that... Very likely you've come across at some point in your life, but it perhaps wasn't talked about in too much detail. And I can't promise extreme levels of detail here. In fact, um, I've given this presentation a few times now, and it's pretty broad in its scope. And I imagine that you're going to have some questions about this topic um, towards the middle, towards the end of the presentation. And I strongly encourage those questions as this is the time for us to discuss it. I'm going to be talking about problematic gaming. In the children and adolescent population, um, and I'm mentioning children and adolescents because these are the generations that are growing up with technology as a mainstream, whereas many of us didn't 
did not really grow up with technology as a mainstream. I, I was born in 1998. And so technology was on the rise and becoming more commonplace in the home, but it wasn't nearly as omnipresent as it is today with three-year-olds having phones and iPads um, at a young age. And so what we're seeing now is mostly affecting the youth. However, make no mistake, it is affecting much of the adult population as well, usually below the age of 40. And so even though many of our audience members here are above the age of 40, nevertheless, it's very likely that you have interactions with people who are younger than you. And this may have been a topic that has come up at some point. And so I thought it would be important for us to discuss it because as a medical community, we actually don't know as much about this as we should. So why am I picking this topic? This is a picture of me when I was four years old. Uh, this is my first interest in science and video games both began. I was always interested in sciences. And when I was a young kid, I was thinking more along the lines of engineering and physics. And I did pursue a degree in physics, but I ended up going into medicine. My heart was just more in line with just the art of medicine. I liked working with people. I liked you know, the idea of, of understanding our human body, understanding health. It just made more sense to me to work on that as opposed to, say, work in a research lab, for example. And that interest kind of developed uh, on the left side of that picture is my older sister and uh, in the middle is my younger brother. And I was also interested in health as a young age, although I didn't really know it. I liked going to my pediatrician, minus the fact that I had to get a shot. I mean, nobody likes that, but you know, it is what it is. You just kind of have to live with it. And I wasn't that kid who would sit at home and play video games all day. That wasn't me. I would go to school just like anybody else. I'd come home, eat lunch, do all my homework, get it all done, get it out of the way. Next thing I did, I went outside. I was that kid on the bike, scooter, rollerblade, skateboard, you name it, I've done it. I, I just love going outside. It's just I just love being active. I'd have friends to play with. It was it was so much fun. I, I really loved doing that. And it would get me tired at the end of the day. And the street lamps would come on. Yes, it would get dark. I wouldn't be allowed to stay outside too much longer. And so what would I do? I would come inside and I had some time to my hands. I'd play video games. So it was a pretty good balance. You know, I did my school, I did my exercise, did my gaming. Pretty nice, but we see nowadays there is a growing trend of folks who aren't going outside as much as they used to years prior, and even prior to my generation, as a matter of fact. And we're seeing a rise of people spending too much time on the screen, and that's leading to the chronic health problems that you know you talk about here in lifestyle medicine. Some of the very chronic problems that you are familiar with. For the generation of today, it's a lot of those problems are being caused by excess screen time or excess sedentary activity. And I really wanted to address that. And if the question is, is it relevant? Well, I probably hammered this home. Yes, it is relevant. Um, what I'm talking about specifically is gaming, but more broadly, it does also include things like internet use and social media use. You can kind of put it all together. But gaming is the one area that I'm particularly interested in since it tends to be poorly understood. Many people watch TV, many people are on social media, and may be surprised to know many people play video games. It is estimated that about 3 billion people play video games, and I'm not just including things like, you know, an Xbox or a Nintendo Wii, the, the big guns you might be familiar with. I'm just talking about games on your phone. Yeah, ever since the advent of the touchscreen, the App Store is now flooded with all kinds of games of all kinds of genres. I mean, you could pick up and play quite literally anything, and you don't need to buy a console. You don't need to have a hobby of being a gamer. You can just play it on your phone. My mom plays Candy Crush. She has a phone. You know, that's that's an example of a game, among other things. And so a lot of people do play video games, whether they realize it or not. It's just a degree to which that they actually play. When we're talking about the children and adolescent population, we're looking at about 90% of them playing video games. And this is a conservative estimate. I was actually looking at a lot of different research papers, and I found numbers, percentages as high as 95, 96%. So I just thought I'd do 90% as a fair conservative estimate. I didn't want to go over. But that just goes to show you the scope of this um, scope of technology and how it's affecting the younger generation. So when I was growing up, uh, being that I was born in 1998, so it was late 90s into 2000s, if you were a kid who were playing video games, there was a small handful of you, and you all kind of became friends. At least most of the friends that I made were friends that I played video games with. You were the nerds. It was it, it, That's just how it was. Uh, but nowadays, um, and I've, I've seen this working in an elementary school, working at a variety of elementary schools uh, before and during medical school, and when I talk about video games, suddenly every kid is asking me questions about it. I'm thinking, wow, when I was growing up as a kid, it was maybe five students out of 30 in a class, but now it's 
quite literally everybody, uh, more so boys than it is girls, but nevertheless, I mean, the vast majority of them are interested in it. So the idea that it's a niche hobby, that's a thing of the past. I mean, you can go even before to generations prior. I mean, consoles were a very niche thing. You you either had it or you didn't, and most people didn't. It was kind of a hobby that you picked up as a niche activity, but you didn't really think much of it because there were other things that you developed your interest in that you have shared connections with for other people. And the video games were relatively simplistic compared to the video games of today. So there really wasn't as much entertainment value to be derived from them as there are of the games of today. But as we see, that trend is changing, especially as people are turning towards the internet, social media to live their virtual lives. Um, gaming is very much intertwined in all of this. It's an evolving landscape, kind of as I alluded to, especially over the past 15 to 20 years. I'm talking about just how it evolved from when I was in school to when the kids started in school today. You know, back in the day, if you were to say, oh, I want to become a professional video gamer, I mean, it was a pipe dream. Everybody laughed at you. It, nobody could take you seriously. But nowadays, the idea of working within the gaming sector, be it as a game developer, as a marketer, as a competitive player, as a semi professional player, um, I didn't mention this in my afternoon presentation, but you'd be surprised to find out that there are plenty of college scholarships available to play competitive video games, and you can get your tuition taken care of. Uh, a school near me, um, UC Irvine, University of California, Irvine, if you are good enough, I mean, you can have your tuition paid for by playing competitive video games like the one that you're seeing on the screen. It's really fascinating stuff. And I want to point to that picture on the top right. Some of you may recognize this picture, some of you may not, but that is a stadium. It's a track and field stadium, but it's a special one. It's the Bird's Nest in Beijing. You might recognize that because that was the central location of the 2008 Summer Olympics. Nine years later, it was hosting a world tournament for a video game. Nine years later, from Olympics to video games. I mean, this is a change that I never thought I'd see. And here we are, renting out Olympic stadiums for video games. And it, granted, it's League of Legends. It's the most popular computer game today with hundreds of millions of players. Nevertheless, the idea that <clears throat> the viewership of competitive video gaming could be anywhere remotely comparable to traditional sports. I mean, just 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that was just that was a dream. But it's happening now. So this is very much on the rise and it's not something that we can ignore. And there are multiple reasons why people play video games. I mentioned two here, but there are actually quite a bit more. Convenience. I mean, this is a pretty obvious one. If you compare to any other social or sporting outlet, gaming is done in the comfort of your home. Uh, the example I like to give is um, I used to play soccer as a kid. And so what did I have to do? I needed to have my jersey. The weather needed to be right. It was raining. We weren't playing. Uh, we had to drive over to the field. We had a coach. We had drills. You know, we had all the equipment laid out. We had to have 5, 10, 15 people there. You know, we had to have people dropping it off the kids and so on and so forth, people watching them. I mean, it's a whole endeavor just to get people to have an organized game of soccer. But gaming, you can have a pretty robust competitive experience from the comfort of your home. And I don't want to get into the details because if we, we get into the details of all of the video games and we could be here forever. But just know that the competitive uh, spirit, the competitive fun that you get out of sports, you can get through gaming at a much, much more convenient way. Community is another one. A lot of socialization occurs online nowadays, right? And gaming has a lot of capabilities that allow people to communicate with their friends or even family online. But one of the examples I gave in the afternoon session, I know I keep referring to that, is I have a friend up in Oregon. His name is Keith. He actually goes to the Western U campus over in Lebanon. I've never met this guy in person. I've never met any of his friends in person, but they're all friends with me. And I connected through them through video gaming. And it's through that that through the video gaming is where we got each other's contact information. We even study together and so on and so forth. So this idea that you can't make friends online. Again, it's starting to become a thing of the past. In elementary school, actually, I was asked a question where I had to do a writing exercise. And in that writing exercise, I was asked, can you make friends online? And many people said no. But if you were to ask elementary school kids or even middle school, high school, the same question, very likely they're going to say yes. And 
Other reasons could be for playing video games, competition. I mean, who doesn't like a good competition? Uh, my neighbors play cornhole. Very simple game. You just toss a beanbag into what I believe to be is called the cornhole. But people have a lot of fun with it. As with any game, you give any game at maybe axe throwing, archery, maybe just, just running a lap and seeing who runs the fastest. I mean, people love competitions. It's within our spirit to do that. And gaming gives you a clear outlet to do that. There are some video games, I think I think you can imagine that most video games have an objective that you need to do, that you need to complete. There are some video games that give you the creative freedom to do whatever you want within the confines of that video game. So it can be a creative outlet for people. And so we can get into the weeds of all the different details, but nevertheless, there are a lot of reasons why people play video games to begin with. It's not just entertainment, as many people like to believe. It's also the community factor. It's the challenge factor. It's... Another another reason actually is competency, right? You can learn skills through video gaming. For example, if you remember Nintendo Wii released Wii Fit, which was your way to exercise through video gaming. And if you have the Nintendo Switch or if you know people who have a Nintendo Switch, there is the Ring Fit, which is using a ring and performing fitness activities in the context of a video game. And so now you're learning how to exercise. And there are also video games for doctors, teaching them how to do certain procedures that they can get continuing medical education credits for. And so I spoke a lot about the different things that video gaming has to offer. It's not just entertainment. It's so much more to it than that. The problem is, how do we reconcile all these you know, benefits of entertainment, of community, of challenges with the problems? This is where it gets pretty difficult. One of the biggest reasons why people would have trouble, you know, with their relationship with gaming is avoidance. If, say, school work is giving you a hard time, you can just ignore ignore your responsibilities and sit down and play video games. If your home life is difficult, maybe you're maybe for a kid, their parents are arguing all the time and they want to avoid the parents arguing. They play video games. Um, I actually didn't mention this in the afternoon session. I was on my pediatrics rotation and I was talking to a 17 year old kid who uh, does not like his home life at all. And there are, there are multiple reasons for that, but the long story short is um, with his parents and their situation, his home life is very, very unsteady. And every time he's out of the house, he's happy. And every time he's in the house, it's just a recipe for disaster. And gaming was his only outlet, you know, and fortunately for him, he was never addicted to the video games. He has other problems that he's dealing with. But the fact that the video games have helped him at least avoid some of the stresses is really good. But it also doesn't address the root problem of why the family dynamic is, you know, compromised in the first place. So that could be one reason. Um, I, I can even give my own example as somebody who is going through medical school, I have to do a lot of studying. And so I spend so much of my time studying and so little time hanging out with other people. By the time I'm done, 8, 9, 10 p.m., whatever it is, it's kind of too late to go to the gym. I'm trying to wind down for the night. Um, no, nobody's going to hang out with me at 9 p.m., 10 p.m. So what do I do? I could just turn on video games and I can get that entertainment and you know go to that online community that wouldn't be otherwise available had I only been relying on, you know, the in-person, right? So again, that can be a benefit, that can be a pro side for me, but there can also be a downside to that, which is physical and social impairments. I know in lifestyle medicine, we talk about a lot of how, you know, every little thing we do matters. You know, sleep and metabolic dysfunction is pretty big, right? If you're going to be spending time on a screen immediately before you sleep, probably not a good idea. You know, we are told we got to Low, dim the lights in the house, avoid screen time a little bit before bed. So then we know how important sleep is. It's a great reset to our day. So if we're not getting quality sleep, that's going to affect how we perform the next day and the next day and the next day and so on and so forth. And it, and it just snowballs. And so people who have problematic gaming, they're playing games well past their bedtime and that's going to affect their sleep. And naturally, that's going to cause some metabolic dysfunction, Right. Some of you might think, okay, well, what does that metabolic dysfunction look like? It usually looks like, you know, early onset diabetes, weight gain, but weight loss is another one. And I, I didn't mention this. And most people don't know that weight loss is another one. There's a stereotypical idea that somebody who has problematic gaming is, you know, binge eating food and snacks and sugary 
energy drinks. And that is true. And that will cause weight gain. But there is also the subtype of people who play video games who are so focused on the screen and whatever is going on in there that they forget to eat entirely and they can go days without eating. And that can cause um, that can eventually lead to, you know, being what's what's the word? Underweight, but a, ser a serious type of underweight. I'm, I'm trying to think of a proper word for that, but that could be another issue. Eye strain, back pain, repetitive use injury. Dr. Ross, I know you're unmuted. There's a word for it, right? Mal Malnourished, maybe. Malnourished, yes. <laughs> Simple <laughs> word. I could. I just couldn't think of it. Or or cache cachexia is the other. Yeah. Thing. Oh, cachexia. Yeah, yeah. And, and that does happen. And at the very highest level, I mean, if we were to go down the iceberg of severity, yes, those types of people can end up in the emergency room due to emergencies that are secondary to uh, malnourishment. Social impairments. Now I talked, this is an interesting one, because I talked about how video games can harbor a sense of community. For example, I've seen this a lot in elementary school where the kids are friends with each other and then they'll say, okay, I'll meet you um, online when we get home. I'm thinking, wow, this is great. Well, we have friends in person who are connecting with each other online and they have that you know, constant level of communication, that socialization, and that's pretty healthy for them. The problem is, if your only socialization is happening online, in an environment that's anonymous, in an environment that is the internet, I mean, you've probably used social media, you know that the online interaction isn't as genuine, or as serious, or even as balanced as the real world. For example, me being an anonymous person on the internet, I can get away with saying a bunch of horrible things and nothing would happen to me. But if I said it to somebody in person, I'd probably get punched in the face if I said something incorrect. And so there's a check and balance. I'm not advocating for violence, but I'm saying that once you're in the internet rabbit hole, you start to kind of forget how to interact with people in the real world. And that is definitely something that happens. A warped sense of reality is another one. Now you have all your awards, your awards from the video game telling you you're doing a great job. There's a ranking system for some of the competitive video games that puts you against each other to see how good you are and who doesn't like a good competition. Your social network is there. And so when you put all of those together, why do you feel incentivized in any way to interact with people in the real world? Why would you care to interact with any of your classmates when you can just interact with folks online? Why would you care to make friendships with people who are just going to go to a different school if you're, say, fifth grade going to sixth grade, when you can just maintain your friendships online with people that you've never met, right? And it can if you meet the wrong types of people online, which unfortunately is not hard to do, you can see where this can become problematic. But what do we know? I mean, I talked so much about all the stuff considering, you know, the pros and the cons, but does the medical community really have an understanding of this? The answer is no. By and large, we don't. That said, there is a DSM diagnosis for it. Go figure. Uh, and this was made in 2013. I don't want to, you know, read out all the criteria. It becomes a bit much. But mainstream medicine, by and large, has to yet to catch up on what gaming disorder actually is. And a lot of people see gaming as just pure dopamine and entertainment, but there's actually a lot more to it, as I talked about. And although this diagnosis came out in 2013, the vast majority of healthcare professionals I've talked to have no idea how to tackle this or even what this is. So this is interesting because we have a situation where the research is moving at a certain rate, let's say a linear rate, but then the technology, the gaming, the internet, the social media, we've seen it radically change just over the past 10 years. So the growth of technology by and large is exponential. And so institutions like the institution, like the institution of research that we've historically relied on to get our information and then use that information for the patient population is now lagging behind. And that it can be problematic because now we have a void where we have all these problems occurring, but we don't have the knowledge to understand how to tackle it, right? And so there's that disconnect. And so to tackle this problem, it's really going to require a, you know, a headstrong, forward-thinking approach where you're constantly updated onto what the latest trends and technology are, rather than sitting back and waiting for a PubMed article. That's not going to do it anymore. And this was a 
paper that was kind of made in conjunction with the DSM-5. So you could see that at the highest level, when you're talking about addiction, we talk about things that cause you to give up other activities. For example, if you're gaming and you're no longer riding your bike, doing your homework, so on and so forth, whatever it might look like, the negative consequences. So if it's affecting your physical health, your mental health, your relationships with others, and if you're continuing to do so, despite all of these negative consequences, all of these are very likely going to point you into a direction of problematic to addictive gaming. So it is a spectrum, uh, but that's something to look at. And so on the surface, when you look at a DSM diagnosis, you might think, oh, this kind of looks like other addictions. And in a way, yes, but it's also very different. I mean, if you compare, I've had, I, I watched a YouTube video once where somebody was comparing video game addiction to heroin. And I thought it's, it's not even the same thing. It's not even close. I mean, how many benefits of heroin can you find versus the benefits of video games? I mean, it's, it's night and day. And, and the effect of heroin is far, far more potent. It's an illicit substance and video gaming is a source of entertainment and a, and a safe space for many, a community for many. So to, to compare apples to oranges like that, I mean, it's not going to work. We really need to understand gaming and technology for what it is. It's its own unique entity. And the World Health Organization also got on this in 2019. That's not too long ago when we really think about it. So they classified gaming disorder as an addictive behavior disorder, right? Problem is, um, again, just because the World Health Organization knows this doesn't mean everybody does. And in 2021, this was a, a year after the onset of the pandemic, they were made aware of the benefits of gaming. And that the timing of that was... Kind of interesting because when the pandemic first came on, what happened? We all had to go indoors. So that social network, we lost that social network, that ability to be creative and go outside and be physically active. We were able, we were losing all of those things. And so gaming became a way to fulfill those needs. And the World Health Organization is very much aware of that as well. Now, if we're looking neuroscientifically psychologically we think about behavior change right so what is it about these games that actually cause people to want to change their behavior such that they'd be more inclined to play these games and very simply in, in a simple model you can def divide these into four different styles of tasks where the least likely to change your behavior are the simple and routine tasks here they give the example of walking to a mailbox boring, repetitive, I mean, you, you, there's no, really nothing to it there. Whereas a complex and novel task like navigating in a new city for the first time, that's really going to grab your attention and really stimulate the dopamine circuitry in your brain. And this was just kind of a fun collage I made right here. Uh, a lot of these games, vast majority of these games I've played or know of in some capacity, basically on the bottom left of your screen, you're seeing a lot more games that are simple, repetitive, unlikely that you're going to find anybody who's going to have some sort of problematic or addictive tendencies to these video games. You'll probably notice that they look a little bit more kid-friendly. That's because they are. And then as you go towards the top right, you get towards, I don't want to call them addictive video games, but these are the video games on the top right that are far, far, far more complex, far more novel. And when I say novel, I mean the game's constantly changing and evolving these are the games that are more likely to present with some problematic tendencies that if you have somebody who's playing video games who does have problematic or addictive tendencies, it's more likely than not that they're playing some of the games in the top right. In the children and adolescent population, what you'll notice is that the younger they are, the more they skew towards the bottom left. Those are the games they tend to play. But as they get older, they tend to gravitate towards games on the top right, which are notoriously really competitive. And I want to stress that these games aren't just you know, just idle, mindless. These are very, very complex video games at the top right. I mean, you can compare the intellectual challenge of these to even poker or chess even. I mean, it really, it really is that complicated. And you wouldn't know that if you wouldn't play it, right? For example, if I, you know, go onto the TV and I watch somebody do a 200 meter sprint, I may have never done a 200 meter sprint in my life, but I would know that that's difficult because just about every one of us has in some way, shape or form done some running. We know how difficult cardio is. So when we see people run really fast, we're thinking, wow, that's really impressive, even though we've never done it at that level. 
And the gaming is very similar. You could see maybe your kids, teens, maybe young adults are playing video games and you might not think much of it, but in their head, there's a whole lot of stuff going on there. So they're very much locked in when they play these video games. They are complex, they are difficult, they are competitive. But the more complex, competitive and difficult they are, the more likely that it can lend itself to some problematic issues. So just understanding what games are appropriate for the kids is going to be a really important factor here. And in all this considered, um, we want to think about what types of solutions exist for this, considering it's so broad and so unknown. And what they found is therapy tends to be the best way to approach this. Cognitive behavioral therapy is CBT. That's the big one. And it's pretty self-explanatory, cognitive being your thoughts, behavioral being your behaviors, and then, of course, therapy, assessing the mind-body relationship through gaming. What is it about gaming that it intrigues the person? Why is it that their behavior is changing? And through that, making some modifications. Group therapy is another one. So you might notice that people who play video games are very much passionate about their hobby, and they very much strongly tie it to their identity. So having a group therapy session is likely to help create an environment of understanding that, oh, there are other people like me that I can share this with, people who automatically understand, you know, the lingo and what goes on. That can be pretty helpful. And it encourages social interaction. And group therapies are done in a group setting. And that type of interaction is understandably diminished for, to, for some people, especially if they're online and they're little rabbit holes, then, you know, we got to pull themselves so in order to pull them out of it. Group therapy can be a really good way to do that. Family therapy. Um, I alluded to this earlier, how a dysfunctional home life can cause people to turn to video games as an escape. Um, one of the medical students I worked with, her cousin actually experiences firsthand dysfunctional home life, and she turned to video games as a source of escape. But it got to a point where the home life was so dysfunctional that she pretty much stayed in those video games and she never wanted to leave. It became problematic. Once those family problems were resolved, so too were the gaming problems resolved. So sometimes assessing what's going on in the home is really important. And that's really important. Like when we look at uh, people's home lives, on average, they're, they're not really that great. And this is an overly simplistic statistic that I'm going to share. Sorry if it's like seemingly irrelevant, but I figured I mentioned it. You know, there's a divorce rate of 50%. So you can imagine that in a married household, if they have kids, if they even have kids, let alone, I mean, whatever the case might be, you know, people are generally not happy living with each other. And not to mention the relationships that are intact, how many of those are actually happy? So there's a lot of households that have some level of dysfunction. And you could talk to anybody on the street and they'll probably give you an earful of uh, stories that happen in their household that they're not happy with. And people like to escape their household. Nowadays, you can do that through technology. Gaming is one way to do that. So family therapy, assessing that home dynamic is really important. Now, beyond the doctor visits, there are some preventative ways that we can tackle this problem. Accountability is one. And I mentioned um, the children and adolescent population because technology is this free range thing where you could literally do whatever, right? But that can also be dangerous. I've seen a lot of parents who just kind of free range and give their parents, uh, give their kids the iPad just so they can be quiet so the parents can go do their work. Well, what are you doing? You're not monitoring them. And so you're exposing them to God knows what. And you're not, you're not, you're not the wiser, right? With technology, you can be inside of your home as well as outside of your home at the same time inside the safety of your home whereas outside there's all these dangers that you could be susceptible to and it's not like people at you know the children at adolescent age necessarily know to distinguish what is right and what is wrong even as adults we're not the best judges of what is right what is wrong either one of the examples i gave in the afternoon session was how uh, there are a lot of internet scams that people fall for, those phone scams, those Nigerian print scams, the emails, that primarily affects the older generation. So it's not to say that it's just affecting kids, the relationship between technology and how it affects our behaviors and the kinds of trouble we can get ourselves into, that's for all ages, right? And so when it comes down to gaming, at least, parents should understand what games they're playing, what value are they even getting it or lack thereof. And they should be aware of the social interactions that they that the kids are having online because you have no idea who they're talking to. So it's probably good to know. I know when I um, had friends in school, my parents would always ask me about them. But the fact that 
Uh, some parents are not doing the same with their online friends. That kind of gives me free range to hang out with whatever, and who with whoever, and that could be problematic. Education and guidance is another one. Uh, digital health, wellness, and education, I think, is very small in schools. I haven't um, taken an honest look at various syllabus across um, the various syllabi in the high schools, middle schools, elementary schools in my area to see what has changed. But I know when I was growing up in school, the extent of my digital health knowledge was be careful what you post on social media. And, and that was it. I, I did not get anything else. And well, when it came to things like tobacco usage, oh, I heard I heard the whole nine yards. But with social media, with video gaming technology, there was hardly any. And with kids spending a lot of their time in school, it kind of makes sense to invest in education at the school. Also, because gaming is largely unstructured and people are trying to look for a career or a life in gaming, we should facilitate that structure. If they're going to be spending a lot of time at school, then we should pay a pathway towards you know, healthy gaming and using gaming as a source for intellectual growth. Uh, one example is my little brother. He likes to play this video game that allows him to make modifications to that game. Now, how do you make modifications? Well, you have to be creative. You have to understand the game engine, and you might need to know a little coding. Sure enough, he has a background in computer science. And so for him, playing video games is a creative and intellectual endeavor. And so video games can be used for good, but we just need to create the environment to facilitate that. And it's going to require a lot of mentorship. It's pretty difficult to do, but it is one such solution. Uh, balancing screen time, it's easy to just say, oh, a few hours a day or one hour a day, but that can be pretty difficult, right? Because when we're talking about video games, every video game is very different. For some video games, like you could play one match and it'll last you an hour, and then that's the extent of your game time. And, it, and if so, then that is the extent of your game time. But working with the you know your kids and teens to understand what is a fair amount is going to be really important. So that way they're not getting too carried away if they're trying to play a little extra. And family interactions. I understand with technology, you know, uh, we could be in the same room, but everybody could be using their phones, right? So nobody, so folks aren't really interacting with each other as much regularly. So having family dinners and encouraging that family interaction, essentially what it does is it creates a healthy home environment and that healthy home environment can lead to all sorts of health benefits, one of which is just the ability to talk to your parents about anything. And these are the parents who love you and care about you the most. So if you have a problem, you want to be comfortable talking about it with your siblings, with your family members, and you're not going to do that if you're just sitting on your phone. I know this because on social media, you'll see this a lot. You'll see people who have relationship troubles, personal troubles. And rather than talk about it with their family, they'll make a post on social media. I'm going through this problem. Someone please help me. Well, I mean, are people really going to help you? I mean, there's not really a, exactly a trained psychiatrist that you're talking to. You're talking to a bunch of random people. Uh, like if I'm 13 years old and I'm posting on social media to other 13 year old friends asking me what I should do if I'm having difficulties uh, listening to my parents, most of them are going to say, oh, just do whatever it is you want to do. Don't listen to your parents. You know, you're your own person. Think for yourself. And that, that's not exactly the best advice, right? So being able to create that uh, dynamic where people are comfortable sharing things with their family, that's going to be really important. Another thing I mentioned here is, that, you know, if you have a video game console or, you know, if you're using an iPad or a phone, better to use it in an environment where you can observe and share that physical space and interact with each other. So I'm of the belief that video game consoles should be in a common space. Um, currently, I'm visiting home. I normally live in Ventura, but I drive two hours south. My my home is around like Irvine area. I'm with the folks for about a month. I brought my Nintendo Switch with me. And where is it sitting? It's sitting in the living room, right? So even at the age of 25, I'm still doing this. So it's really important that we do this to cultivate that environment where everybody can interact and talk with each other in a healthy and happy manner. Um, that is all for my presentation. It's pretty broad in scope, as you realize. So I really encourage if any of you have any questions, now is a great time to do so. I'll try my best to answer. Um, thank you all for listening. And if you have any questions, fire away. Thank you very much um, for that. Um, I um, From the afternoon till the evening session here, I got to thinking about there are a number of issues that you've touched upon which may also um, deal with how people make their choices, their food choices. Um, 
uh, lots of issues that kind of overlap each other here. Yeah, it, it does. I, I was also thinking about it too, because my, funny enough, my next rotation that I'm doing is in addiction medicine. And I, <laughs> when it, when you think about addiction, we, we have to think about what humans do naturally. Naturally, we binge, right? We were, we as a human species evolved in environments that were scarce in food, scarce in water, scarce in entertainment. And so anytime those were available, we really gravitated towards those because if we didn't have those, it was going to affect our health and our survivability. But nowadays we live in a world of excess. So we're actively fighting against our own evolution every single time we make a decision. Like if you go to a grocery store, and you see all the options, all the different breads, all the different snacks, eventually you're going to cave and you'll just take one of them off the shelf, even though you didn't need it. I mean, that decision fatigue is very much a thing and we have to fight against it every day. Okay. Are there any, uh, buddy, have any input? Uh, do you have any issues with any of your kids or grandkids with their gaming? Uh, has any, have any of you given much thought to this topic? Just kind of curious. It's um, really seriously under the stress-related activities in our life, for sure, and can impact uh, the movement that we have in this world. Um, so you could, I guess, uh, take your screen down so that I can kind of see what's in the group. There we go. I can now do a gallery and I'll see. Can you have your hand up? But I think that was from before. Can you talk about, wait a second, there's something in the, the chat room here where it says, can you talk about how video games prepare you to join the military and desensitize you to kill for war? Desensitize you to go for so I think this is if I'm understanding this correctly, this is hinting at the video games and violence topic. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. like how much does it promote for that? So so this is interesting. Um well if you're a kid with a violent tendency, but well, kids there are kids with violent tendencies, and if they play violent video games, it's really not the video games, it's the kid. Um, the research answer is video games don't actually promote violence, and they've done numerous studies on this that they don't desensitize you. You can even look at beyond video games. Think about the TV shows, the cartoons we're watching. I know as a kid, I used to watch a lot of you know Spider-Man, Batman, Power Rangers, whatever. These are action movies. Some of them have guns in it. Didn't bother me. And it doesn't bother most kids. And a lot of kids like action movies, right? And video games, similarly, they like action video games, except they like to take a role. Question is, does taking a role in them actually desensitize them? And for the most part, no, it doesn't. Um, the problem isn't so much the violence in the video games. And if you can look at, if you compare multiple video games, like you'll get different responses. For example, if you take a game like Fortnite, that's very popular with the kids. It's a battle royale game where you are one person against 99 others. You drop down in an island. You have to scavenge materials and weapons and shoot everybody down. Last one surviving wins. Sounds pretty violent. Sounds pretty scary. That is until you look up Fortnite and you realize it is a very cartoonish game. The graphics look very silly. And quite honestly, it's pretty appropriate for the most part. Compare that to, say, Call of Duty Battlefield, where when you shoot somebody and blood actually comes out, that's probably not something a kid should be watching anyway. Even if it's TV, social media, video games, probably not the best. What is concerning is suggestive content content that explicitly makes sexual references references to drugs and alcohol strong language um, these violent video games some of them do have that content that's the content you need to worry about take a game like uh, this is an extreme example but take a game like grand theft auto it's literally in the name grand theft auto i mean goodness gracious me right I, I wouldn't have my kid play that. I mean, you literally have missions in the game where you have to run over innocent civilians and go to strip clubs. I don't think I want my kid playing that, quite frankly. But I know so many kids growing up who played those video games because their parents were not the wiser. That's the content that's more concerning because that's going to affect what they find attractive. Not so much the violence in the video games. The research is pretty clear on that part.
I hope that answers the question. Uh, Velvet, and then Dottie. Hi, Bilal. Thank you Hello. so much for doing this. It's interesting. I have course, teenage indeed. kids, and I yeah. have 12, 13, and 19 year old, almost 19 years old. But anyways, my kids play video games, and I just think you brought some good attention to it. And also, like you also pointed out the positive, which I think is good, like the social aspect, because like we really limit the time our kids play video games, especially our 13 and 12 year old who can't do anything. Our 19 year old really doesn't play video games, but <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we really limit the time. But you did point out the positive, And I actually was like, oh, it is kind of a good thing that he is having that socialization during that, you know, that time that he does get to play. And, you know, he'll come home and like get on video games for an hour or so and like get on the phone with his friends and, you know, talk to his friends while they're playing. And I'm like, oh, okay, like that helps me like see that positive correlation mm -hmm. with it as well. Because it's it's hard because I've never really one of my kids playing video games. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just a natural progression in this day and age. Um, mm -hmm. He also plays sports and they do other things. But I don't know, that positive correlation was just helpful to like, Maybe I shouldn't be so hard on him all the time about like, but I do, we do send him outside. We he play sports. They do other things, but mm -hmm. anyways, just thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> no, I'm glad. Yeah. So maybe I, I, I'm not so hard on him all the time about like, you know. Yeah, it, it doesn't, you don't have to be too hard. And quite honestly, easy way to start is to just ask them what it is that they like about the games and what they do when they play them, what they find enjoyable, and just kind of go from there. I think really the answer to anything is be curious. For me, at least, gaming, technology, social media, what it has helped me was in enhance in my knowledge. I'm a naturally curious person. I wouldn't call myself a smart person. I'm a naturally very curious person. If I find a topic uh, uh, just randomly, I'm going to learn about it. And what I feel like the internet has allowed me to do was learned from so many different perspectives and so many different subjects that I've grown in my knowledge and have helped me grow as a person. And part of that was gaming, being able to interact with other people in a competitive environment, in a safe place at home, um, especially to your point about with your friends. So I grew up at a time, and very likely you all did too, where you know the cool kids were doing cool kids things, and perhaps you experienced some level of peer pressure to be like the cool kids. I didn't. And I, I, the reason I didn't, I can directly tie to video games because I was more interested in video games and the friends I was making through that. I didn't care what the cool kids were doing. Mm -hmm. So it saved me from trouble. And so really looking at those positive benefits and, and I guess checking in with your children and seeing how they're feeling about their gaming and the friends they have, that's that's really a good way to make that connection. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. Thank you yeah, for sharing thank that. Thank you. I think the thing that scares me more is YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so I try to keep them away yeah. from YouTube as much as possible because it's really hard to manage what they're watching on YouTube. It is. And um, that's another rabbit hole in itself because we talk about social media algorithms. If I log into my YouTube and you log into your YouTube, we put them side by side. We're seeing very different versions of the internet. And that, that catered environment, I mean, the, the data that they collect on us, I mean, they, they know us better. And so we can be very, very susceptible to influence very quickly. So yeah, YouTube can be pretty dangerous in that yeah. sense. Well, thank you so much. Of course. Dottie. Um, I, I guess I had a couple of comments. One is that um, kids need stress reduction too, and I can understand how it works for that. Kids also want to know what the cool things are to be a part, because that's part of their social network, their community. So that is really good. And I think it does help some with critical thinking skills. And the military has done um, games that they use at their recruitment centers to try to test um, dexterity, but also, again, content, you know, about war, strategizing and, and killing. And while we can say that most kids can play games and it's not a problem, it kind of depends on the... Um, the makeup of the kid, the amount of trauma the kid has had, and also the amount of um, parental supervision they have. And I say these things because I worked in child welfare 
and I've retired from child welfare. So, I mean, I've seen everything. And I think that another issue is that our society is that the parents, like I know I'm very much addicted to my phone too. And, you know, we, we get into this mode and we kind of let the, it used to be the TV, you know, would be the, the babysitter and now the phones are babysitters. So we need to teach kids about critical thinking. We need to supervise kids and we need to know that every kid is different and some kids, what may not be a risk factor for others are. So I want to say, in spite of all the good things you've said about it, there can be risk factors too. And so we all have to just be really aware because there's a lot of pressure on kids and, and look at the age of the, um, the game too, because like you said, grand theft auto, I mean, that's not something I would have wanted my kids when they were young to aspire to steal cars, <laughs> mm -hmm. but you know, it, it's just, it's complicated and we can't simplify it too much. We've all got to look at individual situations and just really be aware and raise your kids to think for themselves and use their, set their own alarm and stay on a certain amount of time and teach them how to shut it off for themselves than us having to do it, I think is another thing. Anyway, I could go on about this because child welfare, you see a lot of everything, I can tell yeah. you. Yeah, and I, I'm really glad you mentioned that because everything you said, you hit the nail on the head in an individualized approach is necessary. I mean, all things considered with all those benefits, there are some people who should just not play them, right? Like there are some sports that some kids should not play because they get into fights a lot. For example, um, if you're playing basketball and you're the type of person to get in fights very easily, that's not going to go well because if you go to a basketball court and you start a fight, there are going to be plenty of other bigger guys who are going to harm you. I've seen that. I, I play basketball myself uh, from time to time and I've seen people with a trigger happy personality get themselves into trouble. It's like, Maybe you should work on yourself first before you do that. And so yeah, an individualized approach is definitely really, really important. I'm glad you mentioned that. Anybody else have anything to add? Um, at this afternoon, you did uh, show a slide uh, showing the various age levels of video games with a coding. I was actually not aware of any of those. There may be others. I don't know if you have that slide that's readily handy or not. Uh, which slide is The this? one that showed the E, E, or M. Um, um, this thing? You know, or... the different kinds of, for age groups, the, I, it wasn't oh, in uh, the collage. But mm -hmm. it, it actually had a, um, a coding of the age group that a particular video game goes with. Oh, oh yes, 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 yes. The uh, ESRB rating, this. I did not have a slide on it. No, I just, okay, okay. This, 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 okay. Um, right. So- And you also had a site which people could go to for help potentially. Yes, I did. I I'm surprised I didn't mention, but hey, I, I keep forgetting to put this in my slide. Here we go, healthy gamer. So there are organizations tackling this. Uh, of course, it's in the minority, um, but in this organization in particular, Healthy Gamer, it, it grew pretty quickly over the past few years. And the person who spearheads it is a Harvard trained psychiatrist actually, who himself was once addicted to video games. And that caused him to have a 2.5 GPA, one that could not get him into medical school. And so, you know, he had to figure his way out and, you know, through a bunch of life experiences, he eventually made his way up. He started this organization has been making a pretty big difference in people's lives. So there are organizations similar to this that do, you know, help navigate this difficult landscape of technology and health. But, you know, we still have a long ways to go because there aren't that many healthcare leaders in this space, if that makes sense. But yeah, uh, the ESRB reading, I, I should go over this real quick. So we can ignore early childhood and adults only. These games basically don't exist. I don't want to get into the rabbit hole as to why. Most of the video games you'll see are from E to M. 
M would be some of the more graphic games, more violent games that probably is not suitable for somebody who are kids. And then P to E10 seemed to be pretty good. T is kind of like give or take. Some are good, some are bad. And it really depends on the game itself. Some of them you can actually have these sub ratings here. For example, this says M plus intense violence, blood, strong language. No mention of say if I know parents who don't care about any of this, but the moment it says sexual content, that's a big no no. So if they see a game like this, which says blood and gore, language, sexual content, violence, okay, right? And of course, this is just um, this is a pretty easy convenient rating system of course you would have to kind of look into the game itself maybe go on youtube read some articles about it that could be one way of approaching this um, but th this is a really easy way to just make sure if the game is appropriate for your kid or not i've actually seen a lot of kids my age they play m-rated games and i don't know if this is still a thing but i remember back when i was growing up if you were to if you were buying a mature rated game 17 plus at a GameStop or any game store you had to have a parent with you and To my surprise, a lot of parents would buy their kids these video games. They just didn't know about them. So just being aware that different video games, you know, different strokes for different folks, not everything is appropriate for everybody. So that'll be very important to understand. ESRB is just a convenient way to do this. Now I'm happy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any last questions before we end the session tonight? And next session, we're going to continue on with a few more of those questions. Um, thank you very much, Bilal, for, mm. for sharing that information, for stretching our brains. Uh, it's a topic that um, is probably more important to us than many of us have spent time with. But mm. um, having grandkids, I am kind of curious. And, and um, from the comments we had this afternoon, there were a number of concerns also. So. Mm. Anyway, keep doing what you're doing. And uh, Scott, any last words from you? You good? Yeah, yeah. thank you, Bilal. And uh, also, uh, in just two weeks from tonight, it'll already be January 2nd. So the back to the beginning introduction class. I'll be doing an introduction class two weeks from tonight. And, and then the following week after that, Charlie will do his introduction class. So a good time to bring your family, friends, some new new people to the class. Hopefully we'll get some new people and we'll start the series over again. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's been fun as usual. Till the next time. Happy holidays. Bye -bye. Merry Christmas. Take care. And Merry Christmas. Good night. Merry Christmas.